Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast. Today, we are talking to Richard Hayward from HHMC Global. I'm really excited today about the discussion with Richard because he's someone that really knows his stuff and he really has some deep insight into the area of sales and acquisitions. I've worked together with Rod and Richard from HHMC Global in many, many, many sale and acquisition transactions. And as I said, these guys really know their stuff. They have a lot of really deep insight, not just in the specialist industry that they work in, the recruitment industry, but across the concept of merger and acquisition transactions as a whole. So today, dig in as we talk about the top five key things that will make a business more valuable at sale. Hi, Richard. Welcome along today. So today we're talking about the five key things that will make your business more valuable at sale. So Richard, why do you think this is a topic that is something that our um, listeners should be aware of? Hi, Joanna. Yeah, look, I think as as business owners, obviously there's uh, different strategies that people may take when they think about what exit they will make from their business. Mm. And Realistically, one of the most uh, viable is uh, an exit by a uh, sale, Mm. a trade sale. Mm. And there can be a lot of misconceptions amongst business owners about just what value their business may bring in the market. At HHMC, we mostly deal with small to medium organizations. So a lot of my comments will be in relation to smaller organizations uh, rather Mm. than large corporates. Mm. Yep. And look, just tracking back briefly, you mentioned the concept of trade sale. And I guess some of our listeners may not completely understand what that means in the context of the things we're talking about. So can you give us a quick overview of what you mean when you say trade sale? Yeah. Look, basically a sale to another organization within the same industry, another company, yep, yep. Um, as opposed to management buyout or, yes. or any other options. So basically to those other companies who would see a uh, real interest in, in the business. In the business. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So tell me, what are the five key things that will make your business more valuable at sale? A little bit of an overriding comment here, Joanna, and that is that um, uh, we really focus on service businesses. Mm. So, you know, our expertise is not so much on anyone who makes something. So if if it's Mm. a a product that ultimately ends up on a shelf in a store, that I think there may be some different elements uh, to review there. But looking at service businesses, I'd start with saying it's a given any business has to be profitable. Mm. Absolutely. And have some history of profitability. So I haven't included that as one of the key factors. Mm. So we'll put that aside as being, uh, you know, we take that as a given. Mm. And that's certainly, I guess, particularly relevant for service businesses. Obviously, there's some more tech-related businesses out there that might have the ability to get a good valuation at sale, even if they're not running a profit. But this is certainly one of these areas, if, if someone's looking to sell a service business, they really need to, there needs to be an upside for, for, for a purchaser coming in, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. A technology business that has, for example, that has some great new product, it may not have reached that break-even point yet, and it still has value because the technology is seen as uh, contemporary and uh, people will possibly acquire that based on the the future upside. Mm. But we're talking about service businesses. Mm. You're right. Absolutely right. So Mm. you need to have a history of profitability. Mm. But looking at some of those things that we strongly feel are characteristics that almost always apply. We really look at them as sustainability factors, Mm -hmm. the the elements of the business that make it appear sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you've got elements that make a business appear sustainable, you've also ironically got a better business to be running yourself anyway, right? I mean, there's no downside getting yourself prepared in a way that you've got a highly sustainable business. (laughs) Because if you decide not to sell, it becomes a better business for you to be running anyway. So, Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, even if you weren't going to sell your business, you want to build it up in a way that uh, has sustainability, you know, mm. so that it's giving you a better return. Mm. Always better businesses produce better results. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're doing it in the first place. 
Yeah. But I think a couple of things that I would comment on is that we have, let's look at an example, you know, someone decided after several years of building up a very good business that they want to sell it and they're profitable and they start a sale process. Given that they have these uh, sustainability factors, they'll be attractive. But what will happen is that the buying organizations will be driven ultimately at more analysis they do. So they may see that there's a strategic benefit in acquiring this particular business, but the more that they look at a business, the more their analysis becomes, the deeper they, they go with their analysis, the more that they will then look at the risk factors of the business. Right. Companies, acquiring companies inevitably are driven by reducing their risk. Reducing risk also means on the upside, increasing their return in a shorter amount of, a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly see that from a legal perspective as well. You know, buyers don't like risk. (laughs) Absolutely. So maybe I should uh, look at uh, some of those key factors. Absolutely. Talk about that. Let's launch into those. What's the first of your key factors, Richard? You need really to be able to demonstrate a repeatable business model. And in different service industry segments, that can be exemplified by the types of activities you do. I'm very familiar with the recruitment industry, and I would give the example of temporary placements versus permanent placements. Mm -hmm. Real estate, it would be similar to, you know, a rent roll and property management versus sale of a house. Mm Mm-hmm. The permanent placement gives you a much bigger one-off fee. The sale of a house gives you obviously a pretty substantial fee, but they're all one-off transactions. One-off transactions that you, once you finish, you don't really know where the next one's coming from. Yeah. So, you know, business starts again every time that happens. Temporary placements, contractors and temps in the recruitment industry roll on. If you build up, you know, a hundred of those and you're paying those people every fortnight, they're earning you revenue every fortnight, they're earning you profit every fortnight. And, um, uh, you know, a, a buyer will look at that and say, even if I don't do this acquisition very well, my risk is reduced by the fact that there is a continuous revenue stream. Mm. And I guess some of those repeatable, predictable income streams can also potentially be on the perm side as well. If we've got you know, preferred supplier agreements or, or various contractual rights that the selling business has to offer up that they can transfer over to a buyer as well. Yes, absolutely. It's probably a slight step down from temporaries in that example, mm. but absolutely. If you have contractual arrangements that have a history of being uh, of producing revenue this year, last year, the year before, mm. then that's demonstrable. You know, mm. you can see that it exists, it can be measured, mm. and it, it really means it's quite likely that next year that's going to happen again. Yeah, right. And so it's that predictability of that income that you can then show to a buyer coming in so that they feel that they have some guarantees of the ongoing revenue stream. I I guess that's what we're getting to here, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Whatever you've done in the past is great history in terms of business result, your profit. Whatever you've done in the past is great history and good to know. But any buyer naturally is concerned about what next year's profit is going to be after they have bought the company. Mm. So all of those facts that uh, help support the likelihood of next year being a good year are really key to the decision-making and the value that they may put on the business. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's a really important one. And number two, what's the second key thing that you believe will make your business more valuable at sale? Well, if you think about uh, service businesses, then you know it means you've got to have enough people to deliver those services and sell them in the first place. And ultimately, having a critical mass of staff is a very important factor. Mm. People are inherently important in any service relationship with clients. It's people that sell new business. It's people that uh, do the work. It's not unlikely that when a buyer comes along, you know, two organizations are facing some integration issues and so on, that some people are going to not like that change and move on. If you have a very small business, you know, maybe five or six people, you're pretty exposed. And, uh, you know, a buyer's going to think, well, it's making good profit you know, some good clients. But if something goes wrong and I lose a couple of people, you're not left with very much at all. As to what a critical mass is by size, it's probably pretty dependent on different industries, really. But in businesses that we're familiar with, a number around 12 or or a little more is where you become a bit more sustainable because you've got some critical mass. Mm -hmm. 
And do you also see your clients, do you talk to your clients about ways that they can engage in locking in stuff as well? And I I guess I don't necessarily mean contractually, but although that might be one option, giving them some performance bonuses that encourage them to stay on and carry over to a new organisation. But are there other things that you have seen work well in an organisation to keep the critical mass there, particularly if they have smaller staff numbers, to um, encourage the staff to stay on board through the transition into the new ownership? Look, that's a really good question. I I think a lot of companies don't always do that too well, either on the selling side or the buying side. Mm. And it's one of the reasons why there is frequently a a bit of a turnover when uh, when acquisitions take place. Mm. Look, you know, incentives do work for people motivated by that. And uh, I think uh, many organisations identify the one or two or three really key staff. Sometimes, you know, as you'd know, those names can get written into Mm. purchase and sale Mm. contracts unless there are some good common sense management uh, attention to those people and ensuring that uh, maybe their interests are being addressed longer term, Mm. then maybe some of them will do their required period and leave unless they're feeling that the new organisation works for them. Mm. Which I guess this all leads into an interesting topic as well that we won't talk about today, but um, maybe we should come back together and talk about later on one day, which is points that are relevant in transition, because there's there's a lot of interesting things in, in some of the points that you've talked about now that are relevant to that topic. Definitely. Yeah. So for now, though, moving on to point number three, what's the third key thing that you think makes a business more valuable at sale? I really do think it's important for the business to stand for something, Mm. you know, to have some credibility in the delivery of their services within maybe some sub-specializations or one key area. Uh, I think in the legal world, that's pretty clearly defined. Uh, The larger firms have different divisions in different areas, but there are uh, specialist criminal lawyers and Mm. commercial lawyers. lawyers. Family lawyers. Family lawyers. Personal injury lawyers. That's right. Exactly. (laughs) And and if you translate that through to uh, some other fields of recruitment, client wants to know that you can actually find them the best uh, IT people Mm. or the best accountants. Mm. You have to be able to demonstrate that you have your expertise in the industry segment that you're wanting to work with, that you've been working with. Mm. Uh, And I I think it does apply uh, across different industries. There are PR firms or communications firms who are specialists with um, pharmaceuticals. They know the sector. They're seen as being the the go-to people in that sector. The, The idea of the generalist in any sector, I think, is pretty hard to sustain. Mm. And I guess part of having a niche is building, number one, for for a business that doesn't at the moment, obviously, they need to find a niche to build out, to to build that depth, but they also then need to build up their credibility and authority in that area as well. So I guess it's not just about niching, it's also about niching in a way where they're, they're, they're known for the knowledge in that area. So really getting deep. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, otherwise, why is that client going to use your services? Yeah. Okay, great. And what's the fourth key thing that will make your business more valuable at sale, Richard? Fine balancing act between having too few clients and too many. Mm. <laughs> so it's the, uh, the client revenue distribution. So if your business, you know, we're, again, we're talking about, you know, small to medium businesses. If you built up your business out of just a few clients, it can be very profitable, but it leaves you very exposed. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have a client the size of one of our big four banks, who, you know, who keeps on using your services, you're going to do pretty well. Mm. But decision can be taken to uh, uh, to switch to another supplier pretty quickly, and you've just lost 45% of uh, of your uh, you know annual revenue in one decision. So a good spread of clients being you know reducing that risk to a buyer of the concept of a loss of, you know, one, two, three key clients is critical, not to be taken to extremes. It's also not attractive to have massive churn so that in any year you're pretty much doing new work with new people all the time. You do need to be able to demonstrate continuity of clients. So you've had some clients for two, three years and they continue to use you, ideally with contractual arrangements. That's Mm. great. Mm. But there has to be enough of them to one individual client with perhaps more than, you know, 15% on average over, you know, the three previous years. If it's starting to get to more than 20, 25, 30, depending on the size of your business, you're probably looking a little bit exposed. 
Okay, great. So the recommendation is keep any one client under the 15% of your total turnover level. Try and get a good spread, but not too many clients that you don't have enough depth, I guess, and longevity. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Look, that 15% is, is a, a bit of a guideline. It's not hard and fast. Yes. It just, just to suggest that if that figure is getting too big, much more than that, then, and you have been in business for a few years, you're not just a startup, mm. and then that probably is uh, getting a little bit uh, exposed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Good point. And the fifth and last thing on your list there, Richard, for what will make your business more valuable at sale? It's all about how you engage the client, in what manner, what's your model. This is not new. It's all about the strategy you adopt. Whether you're able to go beyond being a transactional provider of one-offs or provide something that's of added value to the client and strategic benefit to them. So the engagement model. I'm going to use the recruitment industry as an example here because I, I think it's quite a good one and similar concepts apply to other service industries. But many recruitment companies provide a, a person, you know, and there's a vacancy in one of their clients, they provide a person and that's great. They get paid a fee. And look, that can be quite successful but you haven't really embedded yourself with the client. They're not seeing you doing more than just providing this this individual for this position. So there's some excellent uh, examples of recruitment companies who've seen great success by being workforce managers, providing a total workforce solution. Mm-hmm. And for example, it could be someone who's a, a provider of uh, nurses. So they do more than just source the nurses and get the nurses to turn up the first time. They're actually running the entire rosters for their clients and shifts against the rosters mm. and perhaps providing the software to run the shifts and rosters. Mm-hmm. And if you have that type of relationship, that's a long-term ongoing relationship where you're providing clearly a, a, a deeper level of outsourced solution to your customer. Mm. Apart from being of great value add to the customer, it's pretty hard to to lose a client as long as you're doing a good job because um, you're embedded, you're locked in. You know, mm-hmm. they become pretty pretty sticky customers. Mm. You know, they're gonna, they don't make those, they don't start to change those sorts of uh, business relationships readily mm. or quickly. Mm. And I guess having sticky customers then sort of almost creates this full circle coming back to helping to really support the concept of repeatable, predictable income streams where we started out these um, this five key things list. Definitely. It's almost like a big cycle, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, good observation. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And it is that. And it's we started uh, at the outset talking about it. It really is about reducing the risk proposition. You know, am I going to make my return on this investment of acquiring this business within, you know, X period of time? What are those things that reduce that risk for me and increase my likelihood? It is about repeatability and predictability. Yeah. And so then what do you think the action steps are for a business? There's a lot of things there for a business to think about, right? So what are the action steps that you'd recommend to our listeners in terms of how they can go and start implementing some of these things? You know, I guess one of the things is they need to sit down and devote time to thinking about each of these areas and measuring how their business currently performs in each of these areas in repeatable, predictable income streams. Have they got critical mass? Do they stand for something? Do they have a niche that makes them credible? Do they have a good spread of clients? And do they have a good engagement model? I guess it's about referring back to where they are at the moment and building plans for the future. But, you know, how long before a sale does a business owner really need to be going and thinking about each of these areas? Because it seems to me that the things you're talking about here will probably take a while to um, create and to shape until you're in the situation where you're in the best position for sale. Yes, uh, definitely. You said uh, at the outset of your comments there that, um, uh, you know, you need to be able to measure where you are compared to others. And I think that's really a, a very important point. Unless you know where you are and you're measuring it, I don't know how you can move forward. So the starting point is to to see where you fit against some of these key elements I've mentioned mm. so that you can then do things to address them. Yeah. And how do you suggest, given your greatest knowledge is in the recruitment industry. How do you suggest recruitment companies can go about measuring themselves against the standard? How will they find out what the standard is? 
I think in a lot of service industries, and certainly the recruitment industry, getting the benchmarks can be hard to do. Mm. In the last five or six years, that is something that's improved within the recruitment industry. Mm. And there are some comparisons you can draw against consolidated data to give you an idea of, you know, maybe whether your your productivity level is as high as others, where you draw expenses for, for staff overheads versus um, versus other companies, your margins in certain categories against others. So that's very helpful. And I think similar data is reasonably available in, in other industry sectors. And I guess it's also about talking to the right professionals, right? Like like you, Richard, I guess, going to people well, who absolutely. know the industry. <laughs> well, I agree with you there. <laughs> um, but, but it is. It is about getting the right external advice in all things people who can offer experience yeah. and a broad industry viewpoint. Mm. And we obviously do that with a lot of clients. Mm. But it does take some time. People may be a long way removed from having a really sustainable business and that, that might not be very attractive mm. if they are looking to exit sooner rather than later. Mm. Even if they're making a reasonable profit, they just may not have a business that appeals to a buyer because of those issues of risk and the lack of sustainability. Mm. So it can take a couple of years. It can sometimes not be achieved because it's it's a challenge. Mm. The important thing is to be able to develop the roadmap, you know, know where you stand right now and develop the roadmap to make take the actions and make the effort to get to that point where you want to be, where you do have a business that is an attractive sale proposition. Mm. And it seems from all the things that you've been talking about with those five things, as I said right in the beginning, you know, we've covered it, but just to reiterate, obviously working on all of these things makes your business better anyway, makes it a better business to be in, not just at sale, but to also be in and operate yourself. Absolutely, at all times. Yes, you're, if you're developing a business that itself is less exposed, that is able to continually produce good results, then that's great for the owners and the, and the staff within it. All right, great. So just as a summary, today we talked about the five key things that will make your business more valuable at sale or a better business <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> and they were firstly, repeatable, predictable income streams. Two, getting critical mass. So having the right number of staff there. Number three, standing for something, having a niche, having something that underpins your credibility. Number four, Revenue distribution, having a good spread of clients, not being overly exposed to any one client, but not having so many so that you don't have any depth or longevity with your client base. And number five, um, having the right engagement model. So thanks so much for coming along today, Richard. If people want to find out more about some of the topics that you've been talking about today, I believe they can get some information over at your website at hhmc.com.au. Is that right? Absolutely. That's right, Joanna. Thank you. Great. Okay, wonderful. Well, look, thanks a lot for coming on, Richard, and hopefully we'll have you back again one day soon. You're very welcome. Thank you. Great. And thanks also to you, the listener, for tuning in today to the Deal Room podcast. If you would like more information about this topic, head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. That's thedealroompodcast.com, where you'll be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you'd like to read it in more detail. There you'll also find details of how to contact Richard at HHMC Global. And you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of a sale or acquisition. We have a number of great services that help businesses both prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready, and also to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisition process once it's started. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on their size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you want to find out how we might be able to assist. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd really appreciate that. So thanks again for listening in to The Deal Room Podcast. You've been listening to Joanna Oki. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.